Yes. There we go, lovely. Okay, um, well, welcome everybody uh, to this webinar uh, on the Situationist Theses on the Paris Commune. Um, this is being hosted by the History and Heritage uh, Research Theme within Cardiff School of Modern Languages. Um, my name is Sam Young, if you haven't met me before. I am the PGR co-lead of the theme uh, alongside Dr. Rizal Mead, who sadly can't be with us today. Um, this webinar is marking uh, the 150th anniversary of the 1871 Paris Commune which if you didn't hear me just then, uh, took place yesterday, 150 years ago. Uh, for those who don't know, it was a very brief but kind of intense left-wing uprising in Paris that followed the disastrous Franco-Prussian War and the fall of the Second Empire, attempted to bring about radical change to French society uh, before being quite brutally crushed by the reconstituted French army uh, a couple of months later. Um, today, we'll be exploring the Commune specifically in relation to the Situationist International, um, a 1960s intellectual movement who used the commune as a basis for much of its thinking, uh, including reflections on traditional Marxist uh, doctrine and ideas of social urban space. Um, I hope I've got that right. You may be able to correct me in a minute. Um, in particular, we're going to be looking at the Situationists' Theses on the Paris Commune, which is a short uh, text, which I will actually post in the <laughs> chat once we get underway, just so people can consult it throughout if they'd like to. Um, it was originally written in 1962, then published fully in 1965. Um, with me to discuss this uh, is Dr. Alistair Hemmons from uh, Cardiff University, Emlang, lecturer in French, specialising in critical theory and modern European intellectual history. And alongside him is Professor Gabriel Zacharias from University of Campinas in Brazil, who also specialises in critical theory and has done quite extensive research on the Situationist International. Uh, and perhaps the most famous situationist, Guy Debord. Um, and between them, they've both edited the, the collected volume, The Situationist International, a critical handbook, which came out last year. Um, welcome both. Before I begin, I'll do the usual Zoom uh, housekeeping. So uh, as many of you know, this is a Zoom webinar. Uh, you can't be seen except the speakers, uh, but if you do have any questions, please put them in the comments or the Q&A box. Uh, and we'll read them out at the end, um, or I can unmute you and you can read them out. Um, it is being recorded, as you've just seen. Um, depending on how the recording goes, we may be uploading this to the Cardiff MLang YouTube account uh, next week. And just in terms of time, this is an hour long. Uh, the conversation will last about 30 to 40 minutes, and then we'll leave time at the end for questions. Okay, um, right then, let's start things off. Uh, perhaps the most obvious question to ask is whether both of you could introduce the uh, Situationist International for our audience, uh, just to give a bit of background and maybe talk about the theses on the Paris Commune themselves. Okay, let me kick off. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Sam, for that um, great introduction. So uh, the Situationist International, in some, some respects, it's quite um, difficult uh, to describe to newcomers to it because in many ways it defies the usual classifications. But generally, uh, I would describe it as a revolution, um, revolutionary avant-garde organization that existed between 1957 and 1972. And it ba basically emerged out of the uh, radical artistic avant-garde in the 1950s, um, particularly in the kind of vacuum left by uh, surrealism. But from the get-go was very interested in combining this idea of realizing art with um, proletarian revolution. So it's really a kind of a, a merger of uh, the history of the workers' movement with the history of the artistic avant-garde. And then, um, and this is something uh, that we might extrap extrapolate on in a bit, uh, in the, around um, 1961, 1962, there's a watershed moment where the group moves um, further towards the, the, the away from the artistic, more artistic endeavors to an expression of that through the development of a critique of uh, contemporary capitalist society and in particular placing uh, more em emphasis on elaborating uh, reflections on the proletarian movement and things like that. And so in a way, uh, the thesis on the Paris Commune is one of the earlier products of this shift to, to in the more political direction. And in some ways, you've got to be careful because if you if you have a say there's a clear split between artistic period and political period is a bit of a 
is a bit problematical because the political politics is all the way through. But there is a clear shift uh, in emphasis and in, as I say, the elaboration of this social critique of which the theses on the Paris Commune um, are a kind of a, an important early expression. Right. <clears throat> yes, if I can pick up from there. Um, as uh, Alistair has stressed it very well, this, this thesis, they are very uh, emblematic of this shift in the group's organization. And also, if we look at the people involved in producing the thesis, the thesis they were written by uh, Guy Debord, which you mentioned already, together with Ro Van Eigen and Attila Kotani. And uh, Van Eigen and Kotani, when, when they come into the group, they, they are both in Belgium and they're, they are um, some of the people who um, helped bring in the emphasis into politics, right? Their coming into the group was very important for the shift on the group. And, um, and also uh, the thesis were written in a dialogue with uh, the sociologist and philosopher uh, Henri Lefebvre. I'm going to explain that in a bit. But uh, so uh, that's also part of, you know, this, this moment from between 1960 and 1961, in which some members of the group, they are meeting with Lefebvre, discussing with Lefebvre, and then the board is, all, is also going to um, take part into the meetings of another radical group that was called Socialisme Barbarie in France. So it's, um, these relations are very important for us to understand why the group starts uh, shifting its main interests. And this is all done in the, in the middle, you know, in, as part of a general debate that's going on in France and at, at that time that um, where people are trying to uh, develop ideas of a social revolution that are not um, affiliated with uh, Marxist or orthodoxy, especially uh, in opposition to um, Soviet Union and the control of the Communist Party. And um, so the thesis, they were Originally, they were just like a brainstorm, just you know this uh, draft that um, situation is prepared to offer to Henri Lefebvre at his uh, you know, something that he asked them to do, because Lefebvre was working on a book about the subject. He was supposed to write a book about um, the, uh, the Paris Commune for this book series in France, and they, that that's something that they would talk about frequently. So. They just decided to put some ideas on paper, and um, and but that was also the reason why ultimately the group and Lefebvre uh, they ended up you know uh, splitting because what happened is that Lefebvre decided to publish in advance part of his ideas, the ideas he had for the book. He decided to publish it, this as a separate article in a journal called Argument which was a very important journal at the time for a uh, left-wing debate, not affiliated with the Communist Party either. We have to re remember that Lefebvre himself, who was uh, up to the 50s, a member of the Communist Party, and he was uh, finally you know, expelled because of his ideas too. So he, was, he left, and that's when uh, he got closer to the SI. And, but when he published this article, the SI feels betrayed because you know, the SI has a journal. <laughs> it's important to remember that the ideas of the, the group were presented in this uh, journal called Internationale Situationiste. And the fact that he published their idea, uh, situationist ideas in a competing journal was something uh, that they could not accept. So they, they decided to expose Lefebvre for what they considered to be a plagiarism. And so they, the first time the thesis were published, they were published to show that Lefebvre was uh, trying to steal their ideas. So maybe not the best way you know, to show uh, this thesis, but uh, that's, that's how it actually happened. And there, there, there's been a lot of debate around this thesis because of that, because of the, this dispute with Lefebvre. And uh, some people have even proposed that maybe this was all just, you know, the situation is they were lying. They never, they didn't actually write the thesis before Lefebvre. They just pretended doing that afterwards. 
And well, that, that is not true. Uh, I brought here some images to show you of a re recent uh, archival research I, I have uh, conducted in the United States. You know that we have recently many uh, our situations archives, they are now finding their ways into uh, institutional collections. And that's the case of the Beinecke Library at the AU University. They have acquired a lot of uh, material on the SI including the archives of Rovanagen. And I had a look at these archives last year. Unfortunately, I had to stop my research due to the pandemics. But uh, when I was looking into it, I, I saw um, some things that might be of interest for our discussion today. First thing is the fact that we find that also in the Boers archives, the fact that they would very frequently when they were sending postcards to each other, they would choose postcards of the Vendome column. Uh, which is related to their interest in the Paris Commune. As you know, the Vandam column was um, uh, the communists, they, they, they took down the column during the Paris Commune. And that's an image that's very strong for the SI. That's something they mentioned in the thesis. So they would frequently use postcards of the Vandam column when they are communicating among each other. And um, so this is a series of uh, postcards from Gideborg to Ro von Eigen. And uh, we see this image of the Vendom column in a text called Le Mauvais Jour Finiron, which was published before the publication of the thesis. That's from 1962. Actually, there is a paragraph of this text that is quoted in the first uh, paragraph of the thesis on the commune. Uh, so that's the first text in which they talk the, um, specifically about the Paris Commune. Also, the title of the text, the Mauvais Jour for is uh, it's a quote from uh, a song from the Paris Commune, a song written by uh, a song uh, written about the the La Semaine Saint-Grant. Uh, that's the title of the song, right? From Jean Baptiste Clément, the same composer of Le, Le Temps de, de Cities. And uh, so we see the column up and down, right? That's a representation from the, the Paris Commune with this uh, subtitle, with the subtitle Live like Rêve Sauvage. So they are always reading the commune in relation to what they are living in the 50s and 60s. And then in the letters that were exchanged between Van Eigen and the Boer, some letters that were not published yet, so this is all unpublished material, we see that they are discussing the thesis. So they did write the thesis <laughs> before the publication of Lefebvre. That's a, a letter from 1962. And in the letter, we read that uh, Van Eigen writes, I haven't had time to think about the thesis on the commune, but to summarize, we could emphasize festival and the destruction of symbols, the Vendome column, the churches, the Louvre, and the desire to re-poeticize, that is to transform the world with new symbols. I think already in this, uh, uh, first thought about the subject that we see in the in Van Eigen letter to the Boer, we have one of the key ideas of the SI interpretation of uh, the Paris Commune, right? And then finally, in a postcard sent um, that Van Eigen sent to the Boer in April 23rd, 1962, he says uh, that the thesis on the Commune were sent, right? So that's the moment when they have finished the text and sent it, probably he sent it to the Boer and then they sent it to Lefebvre also. And uh, that, so it was in this context that it was written originally then, not a text that was written to, to be presented in the journal. It wasn't written in a, uh, primarily should be published as it is. But then finally they published this in 63 with the Opel Belle Soir and they exposed the, the, the case of plagiarism, as you can see, the publication brings side by side the thesis, the situation is thesis in the commune, the fourth and thesis, and paragraphs of, the, uh, of Lefebvre's article, La Signification de la Commune, to show how they relate uh, directly. Right? So that's how it was uh, originally presented. Do you mind going that, back to that um, postcard on the, of, uh, the um, quarry? Just, just to say, so again, like they, the situation is constantly communicated with themselves using postcards that have personal significance, particularly if it was related to like proletarian revolution. And this is a picture of the town of the uh, quarry in the town where Ralph and Igem was born. And he was born on a street uh, really close to this, uh, uh, next to a street, which is now 
Rue René Magritte, because Magritte uh, used to live there. And so this is all kind of part of the mythology also of the Migem joined the group at the time because he was actually from working class backgrounds, from uh, an area which um, had this really long history of working class radicalism. And one of the things that sparks the move towards politics for the SI and also the joining of the Nigem to the group is there was a kind of forerunner of May 68 that took place in Belgium in, 19, in the winter of 1960 to 1961, where there was a wildcat strike. So a strike that wasn't condoned by the unions and where workers actually um, uh, rebelled uh, even quite violently against uh, the workers' parties and the and the unions. So the situation saw this as a sign that the workers' movement was moving towards a more kind of autonomous, um, uh, self-managed wildcat movement that would be more like the Paris Commune in a certain sense. So looking back to the Paris Commune was a way of trying to understand the present as well. Sorry for interrupting you. <laughs> Just that. Yeah. I was hoping you would add something on that. So that's it. So, so they are always building this kind of bridge and people who are going, so this shift into politics, more into politics. And they, as Alistair said, they were always related to, to some kind of, um, the, to the idea of revolution between art, realizing art and putting art together with proletarian revolution. But from 61 onwards, this become more important. And this is related to the coming of members such as Van Eigen coming from this, uh, uh, working class background, and also Kotani, who was a um, uh, an exile from Hungary, and he was uh, he took part in the uprisings of 1956 in Budapest. Right? So we are talking about people who leave experiences of wild uh, wildcat strikes or of uh, um, uprisings that were that this the situation saw as uh, possible examples of how to uh, how to to do the revolution, right? In, in a way that would be different from the Leninist revolution of the uh, uh, party control revolution. That's really helpful. Thank you both for that explanation. And I'm also glad to see that academic beef over plagiarism is not a new thing, but um, that does lead us quite neatly on to, to sort of the second point, which is, um, could you sort of discuss a bit more about how the situationists use the commune and their thesis on the commune as part of a, a criticism of sort of traditional Marxism and, and sort of orthodox, uh, the orthodox left in Europe. Um, yes, if you could, if you could sort of offer your comments on that. Yeah, so um, I think that a really important um, aspect of the theses and the reflection on the theses that the situationists do at this time is to aim a criticism um, at the, particularly the Trotskyist left, but you know, it's what we call today, you know, the orthodox uh, Marxists. You know, there's even the uh, well. I think they're really they're really thinking about Leninism and Trotskyism, right? Um, and so, if you look at the history of the reception of the Paris Commune within the workers' movement, it had been really dominated by uh, well, first there was the the civil war in France uh, by Marx, which was written at the time, but then also. Um, Engels wrote a preface to that in, uh, when was that? That was 1891. Then uh, 20 years later in 1908, Lenin did his lessons of, on the, of the commune. Then Trotsky did another one in 1921. And um, basically, uh, if we kind of could summarize it with what Trotsky thought about the Paris commune, which is essentially that the Paris commune fail, was a failure because there wasn't a strong party leadership like the Bolsheviks were arguing for and, uh, in, in Russia, right? And so that the, the, the commune failed because it wasn't authoritarian, that there wasn't a hierarchical party structure directing the masses. And Trotsky also uh, criticizes the Paris commune for its particularism, the fact that it, that it, um, it didn't uh, necessarily seek to, I mean, there is a, uh, this is something that, um, that Lenin does bring up and that the situationists do admit, which is that there is a nationalist sort of element to aspects of the commune, right? That it's all about, you know, the French Republic, the universal French Republic and all this kind of stuff. But um, actually the commune um, was also quite anti-nationalist or um, kind of imagine, imagining a sort of universal federation 
of more local uh, forms of autonomous uh, self-governance, right? And uh, Trotsky really hates this kind of particularism. He's much more about the universal revolution being led by a single party, seizing control. Quite explicitly, he says that the communists should be criticized for uh, trying to go against capitalist organization and that, that the communists should adopt capitalist organization. <laughs> Right. So anyway, so and uh, at the end of uh, all of that, Trotsky says, um, we can thus thumb the whole history of the commune page by page, and we'll find it in one single lesson. A strong party leadership is needed. So the situationists then who are really obviously against uh, particularly, you know, you've got to imagine uh, in, by the 1960s, just starting to get lots of news about the horror, the true horrors of uh, the uh, Soviet regime. Um, but also, you know, Trotskyists are still quite a strong faction in Europe. So they're really arguing against, um, trying to develop arguments against uh, these kind of authoritarian authoritarian tendencies. So, that, so what they're trying to do by looking back at the commune is to say, uh, which they do at the, in the, is it the very first thesis, is it? Um, uh, that basically, you know, the, if you look back at the history of the workers' movement, um, these kind of movements like the Paris Commune or the Asturias Revolt or the Spartacus Revolution are seen as failures, or the Kronstadt Rebellion in, in Russia are seen as failures, but actually, um, and uh, these are its greatest successes and its supposed greatest successes being like the, you know, the Soviet, um, the Russian Revolution uh, are actually its greatest failures. And, and why are they the greatest failures? Because they've just turned into state capitalism, essentially, and authoritarianism, and have taken power away from the workers. Um, and whereas these movements that they're looking back to, like the Paris Commune, um, that actually, for the people who are experiencing these movements, actually, they had already gone beyond uh, capitalism. And that's the key thing, right? So, so in short, then, uh, that looking back at the commune reflecting on the commune is a way of criticizing the kind of uh, orthodox marx uh, marxism that had used the paris commune as an excuse for its authoritarianism in many respects thank you very much gabrielle would you like to add to that at all i don't have much to add to that i think i okay. can summarize perfectly the main point of it, I think that's how that's you know the first thesis of the thesis on the commune is precisely on that, right? I have the text there so you can check it. And it's this and, and that's something very strong, I guess. Uh, it's something proposing to invert you know the sense of the reading that for uh, almost um, almost a hundred year a uh, hundred years uh, people had looked to the commune in a certain sense, looking to the community we have to learn why we were defeated and the answer is always the same we didn't have strong leadership we didn't have uh, uh, party apparatus or state apparatus etc and then of course when the situation is they are writing they're writing from a to totally different perspective after you know you, you had the russian revolution and you have the soviet union of, as one of the uh, main uh, superpowers in the dispute of the cold war and then when you look at the soviet union what do you see do you see uh, a different Kind of, you know, actually, you know, real, uh, uh, real communism as as it was hoped for in the texts of uh, Marx or in the uh, in the propositions of the communal. You don't see that. You see some kind of bureaucratic capitalism. You see a lot of uh, blood and oppression, and um, so that's why they, they. It's also a necessity, you know, it's a necessity to reassess the history of the commune because of what had happened after the Russian Revolution. And uh, so, and that's the, the necessity they, 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 they have the courage to face, you know, and that's what they are, they're trying to propose. So uh, let's look into failures as an example of uh, something that could work for, the, for different reasons, right? So that's also when, when they quote Angus saying, well, he said, you want to know Angus wrote, you want to know how the, the proletarian dictatorship looks like just look at the commune and then they say okay yes look at the community then you're going to understand why what we have in the soviet union is not that right it's not what we're yeah. looking for 
So, uh, and I think this is all very, uh, this is one, this is very typical of the SI of the way they saw the, the they try to mobilize the forces of the, the history of the workers' movement in a different sense. And that's also why they became such a strong drive for the movements of 1968 for the, for the, uh, or for different movie, movements after 68 that try to, uh, to, to propose, you know, uh, uh, some kind of uh, political action that was not, uh, that could not be, uh, uh, that didn't feel represented in the common, uh, uh, the visions of the left that we had so far, right? You, you look at the, even anarchism, you know, many, many uh, a lot of what the SI wrote uh, has, um, have many in common points of anarchism in its critique of representation and its critique of state, but also anarchist federation at the time, they were very resistant against uh, situationists because they were also being criticized uh, by the SI. If you open uh, the board Society of the Spectacle, you're going to see uh, there's one uh, chapter on uh, the proletarian revolution and the representation, uh, the, uh, the historical subject and its representation. And uh, he's going to present a balance of this debate, you know, this historical debate between anarchism and, and, uh, and socialism and uh, Mar uh, traditional Marxism and he's going to criticize everyone <laughs> so this this is really this is also one of the things i think they are projecting when uh, on the commune when they look to the commune if you go to the end of the text you're going to see that um see that's a very good example of, of what i wanted to say in the, this series they say the audacity and inventiveness of the commune must obviously be measured not in relation to our time but in terms of the political intellectual moral attitude of its own time in terms of the solidarity of all the common assumptions right so the solidarity of all common common assumptions that need to be criticized either on the right or on the left that stuff that they saw on the commune i don't know how true that is to the paris commune itself you know because paris commune is more about you know action than, than ideological debate. That, that, that's very true uh, for what the SI hoped to do in their own time. That's what they wanted to do. They wanted to, to break this solidarity of you know, uh, common places that would, uh, make, uh, would prevent uh, revolution to, uh, of going forward. That's also one of the things, one of the strongest sentences in this um, uh, thesis maybe is when they say that uh, the Paris Commune succumbed less to the force of arms than to the force of habit. You know? So the, this, this idea that this necessity to, to dare to imagine something new, it's part of this revolutionary process. And uh, that's something that they saw in the commune, in the spontaneity of the commune, and something they were trying to recover for the uh, revolutionary movement in the 50s and 60s. Yes, thank you very much. Um, really well explained, both. Um, uh, kind of this idea of of sort of uh, exploding almost as sort of uh, the world around you and the and the um, the norms around you kind of brings us on to the point then of how the situationists used uh, the commune and their thinking on the commune to uh, in the sort of construction of their theories around social space so not just in the criticism of the left but also in in sort of um, the criticism of wider society particularly in terms of urban space um, I was wondering if you could um, both have a so word on that. Yeah, so the situationists um, very early on developed this, uh, several ideas, uh, the derive, uh, psychogeography and unitary urbanism. And derive was essentially like a critical practice of kind of walking around and reflecting on how um, social space, the kind of effect that social space has upon the individual and collective subject. And psychogeography was kind of the kind of study of um, the effect of the urban environment on on people, and uh, that and that, and by implication, the kind of the mean. What does it mean? What does this space mean? What is it? How is it shaping people? Etc. What's the logic of it? And then unitary urbanism would be the kind of utopian imagining. Like, well, what would a society? Uh, how would social space transform if uh, we were to go beyond capitalism? So you know, obviously, a big part of that is around. Um, the kind of how the city is constructed and the particular symbols 
uh, you know, monuments, uh, buildings and so on and so forth and what they signify for the people uh, within them. And, uh, you know, the situationists, they were very, although it was a genuinely international movement, it really a lot of the focus, particularly a lot of the key ideas, um, the kind of mythology the SI built up around their kind of interests uh, was centred on Paris. And obviously um, <clears throat> there was Hausmann's Paris, which was the legacy of you know, kind of the 19th century, but then also the the Paris of the post-war period with the big concrete tower blocks and you know the putting of a big motorway on the um, left bank of the Seine and things like that, right? So they were so they're trying to understand all of that. Now for them, they're dealing with the post-war Paris, but the Commune is dealing with Haussmann's Paris, right? So this transformation of Paris under uh, of the Second Empire and continuing through the Third Republic, and um, they see that Paris is essentially, both, both Paris is essentially um, forms of social control and of uh, allowing circulation of goods and things like that. So it's very much this idea from Walter Benjamin, um, who, you know, uh, who, who came up with this idea that the, um, the big wide boulevards, um, although they might appear that is for leisure and for visual pleasure, actually for moving troops quickly and stuff like that, you know, and it is true that essentially it made barricades useless during the Paris Commune because you could just put art artillery at the end of one barricade and at the end of one street and shoot a barricade or you know you can move troops quickly through the city and things like that. So there is an element of that and uh, de Boer in an early text from 55 writes um, but from anything other than the perspective of policing Haussmann's Paris is a city built by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing. So that the whole, so this whole, you know, the city being celebrated as a, uh, you know, this great achievement uh, of French genius is actually just a, a big um, uh, way of controlling people, a big, uh, that means nothing from a kind of creative human perspective. Now, so then the situation is reflecting back on what the commune did. Now, the commune um, famously uh, took down the Vendôme column, and that was partly, uh, in, in the, the reasons that the commune decided to do that, if you look at the deliberations, the decision, it was partly about, uh, of course, you know, they were, they hated the second empire and Napoleon uh, represented, um, you know, was the kind of legitimating myth of uh, Napoleon III, who'd just been thrown out after the um, Franco-Prussian War. But they also explicitly say that it's a symbol of militarism and they were very much against, you know, the army and the kind of uh, military, the way, the, the role of mi the military, the modern military in, in French society. And so, uh, and, and of barbarism, right? So the, of essentially the, the murderousness of, of war. So, so they tore it down. And so the situationists then see this as a symbol, uh, uh, as a kind of an example of unitary urbanism, right? That there is a this symbol that represents the old world that needs to be destroyed. And one of the things that they say that comes uh, throughout the text is that, well, the commune engaged in unitary urbanism, but because it was so short lived and because they knew they were being destroyed, it took only a destructive form. So they destroyed the Vendôme column, they destroyed the house of um, one of the key Versailles politicians, Adortier, and um, they also, as they were being finally being uh, killed at the very end during the bloody week, they set fire to the Tuileries, the Hotel de Ville and other buildings. Okay, So um, for them, that's a, that's a simple, because these things represented them, to them the old world that they want to destroy. And this was their last act of defiance. And there's even a, um, a section that has quite a lot of resonance now in light of the recent destruction of the uh, Notre Dame Cathedral, the, the recent um, fire where these workers actually went to the Notre Dame Cathedral and they wanted to burn it down, they wanted to destroy it. And then these artists uh, were apparently there as well and they were saying, no, we're not gonna let you do that. Um, and the situationists pose this in terms of, well, these are artists um, who are, you know, specialized in, you know, special, you know, in the kind of a, have a specialized role in society. The situationists are against specialized uh, artistic roles and, and so on and so forth. Um, and they're arguing in favor of, of essentially the aesthetics of an eternal aesthetics of the old world, whereas these workers are in the moment breaking through that specialism and trying to, uh, you know, uh, make a statement, essentially. Right. 
So, um, so, if it's, you know, and that statement is a kind of anti-clerical, the role of Catholicism in, in contemporary French society and things like that. I think, you know, uh, we were chatting about this yesterday, weren't we, Gabriel, about how probably the board later on was very much in favour, actually, of, you know, the kind of the old buildings of Paris and stuff like that. So maybe he would, he would definitely have commented on the burning down of Notre Dame um, a couple of years ago. Um, but yeah, so this, so this is the idea then. Uh, and then, of course, this has kind of resonances with the uh, recent um, debates within, you know, all over the world internationally, really, about, for example, the destruction of statues uh, of people who were involved with slavery. And, and also even Napoleon himself, of course, institu reinstituted slavery um, in France. Don't know if you want to elaborate, Gabriel. I think you said it all. I love the sentence, you know, refusing to accept the innocence of any monument. It, it, it sounds with that uh, famous sentence from Walter Benjamin that all monuments of, of culture are monuments of barbarism. And um, seeing that, I don't know if you're hearing the noise from the house next door that you're just- That's all right, it's not too bad. A little bit, but it's, <laughs> yeah, you're all right. We can, we can just imagine that that's the ambience ambience of tearing down the random column right? and people are destroying monuments next door while I speak and I, I'm sorry for that that's part of you know this it's funny because you know uh, the SI they were very critical of um, how people uh, they were very critical of the alienation of urban space right the fact that I think that's one of the most um, um, most sensitive issues you know for people when they are they are they discover the SI many times it's through this approach because it's quite easy to explain to people that they live in a space uh, over which they have no uh, control right we live in cities but we cannot decide what we do with our cities why things are as they are in the space we inhabit and they wanted to change that they wanted cities to be you know uh, 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 rediscovered from an, an effective point of view and that in, an, in, in, in a different society we would together decide how we organize the space we live in in, in a total, totally different sense from that of uh, modern urbanism which was uh, based on the idea of separating the functions of the city you know so you, here is the place to live here's the place to work and here's a place for leisure and they wanted to you know just uh, uh, have um, all those things uh, together. Of course, we uh, remember, and it's important to remember, Alistair is here to remember uh, everyone of that, that the SI was uh, against work, right? They were critics of work and stuff, uh, of having a society based in uh, uh, abstract uh, labor. But, um, and, and of course, it's because of the society based on that, on the creation of, of commodities, <laughs> that, that was the term. Because society is based on that, that we have uh, uh, urban space organized as it is, right? Because people have to go from uh, home to, uh, to uh, we have to guarantee the circulation of workers and commodities. And uh, they wanted to change that. And that's usually a very good way to get people uh, to understand what they're talking about, right? Because I think that's something we all feel it's close to us. Also, um, and, and in the situation we are now, what can we say now, right? Now we can, I don't know how you are uh, currently in, in the UK or in Cardiff, but we are now going for some kind of lockdown here because uh, the pandemic situation is horrible at this moment in Brazil. I think it's worse than every, anywhere else in the world. So we are really, you know, even the idea of just going out on the streets, go to work, it, it starts to sound uh, utopian, right? And so it's a good example to see how, how easily those things can be taken away from us and how uh, far from you know, 50 years after the, the SI, we are uh, further from, uh, they, from, from what they were you know, uh, in terms of uh, recovering the control of, of urban space, right? Of course, these uh, moments as the one we had of people destroying very recently, we had this wave of destruction of monuments for the colonial purposes. This was very interesting. And this was once again, the proof that monuments are not innocent. And from time to time, we have, we have to realize that, right? This was not in the moment of 
uh, a, revol a revolutionary uprising like the Commune in 1871. But it was also, you know, I think what, this was part uh, of getting back on to the streets after the, the first uh, pandemic wave, right? So people started go, get, go, going out of the lockdown and then they saw the streets in a different light. Oh yes, so those, those are the streets we live in. This is the place we inhabit. What is that statue doing there, right? You know, it was kind of awakened about the fact that all of those are symbols and those symbols, they are affecting directly there. They're not just something separated from actual practice symbols they affect how we live space and if we if we don't agree with, with that we have to change them and we have to tear down uh, columns and statues and this is a this is a something this is a permanent lesson that this is a lesson that no one else in the traditional Marxism and traditional left they didn't learn this lesson from the community they didn't point this out this is something that is specific in the reading of the SI because they are so um, concern about changing the way we inhabit urban space. That's really interesting. It really reminds me, um, I think it's a Yugoslav art movement whose slogan was monuments should not be trusted. I think it brings across the same sort of idea there. Um, very quickly then, because I realize we're nearly into question time. Um, are there any other points you'd both like to make about the sort of impact um, that the theses of the Paris Commune, this text has had since it was uh, published anything any sort of comments on its legacy as such yeah i mean i think uh, we were again chatting about this last night but it's a bit speculative i think there's actually you could do quite uh, some interesting uh, research uh, about about this you know how have these how has this text come to and the in situation is uh, interest in the commune in general come to influence um uh, our reception of the commune uh, particularly in france but also perhaps even in the academy right because you know um the information that the situationists had to them about the commune was much more limited than it is today and the historiography on the commune was much more limited you know at the moment uh, with the anniversary there's absolutely a huge amount uh, you know french bookshops i mean i can't go unfortunately but i can see pictures they're full of books uh, about reflecting on the commune in all sorts of ways and i and um and i think that i think that situations probably did play uh, an important role in in, in uh, ultimately people raising interests in the commune and reflecting on it, and particularly as a result of 1968, right? So um, the Situationist International, uh, you know, is often attributed to having had a role in the prov in provoking the May 68 events and in some of the uh, kind of um, inflections that it took on cultural inflections, critical, theoretical, et cetera, et cetera. And the commune was constantly being evoked during uh, May 68 in a way that it hadn't really been um, in, you know, some previous uh, kind of protests and uprisings and things like that. And I think this probably is a result of the situationist, you know, the you know, situationist text circulating um, and also Ralph and Igem's The Revolution of Everyday Life, uh, which refers to the commune um, uh, frequently and actually uh, Van Eigen adds to the you know the old slogan of uh, workers of the world unite he says that in reference to the commune um, workers of all times unite so that when uh, by evoking the commune and engaging in the revolution now um, you are you are in a sense in a, in a part of a, a kind of um, moment where space-time uh, different moments of space time come together and that you are part you know you you now in may 68 and the communards of 1870 or whatever are all part of this movement in a way it's kind of part of that kind of traditional um marxist uh teleology of proletarian struggle um but certainly i, I think yeah that, that the si played a role in making the paris commune a feature of the of the of may 68 and post and post 68 and I, I you know, can see that particularly that kind of influence um, on uh, contemporary um, uh, academic like Kristen Ross and her book, The uh, Communal Luxury, The Imaginary of the Paris Commune, which, which really goes very much in the direction uh, of reflecting on the commune in a way that's quite similar to what the situationists are interested in. She's, she was also heavily influenced by Henri Lefebvre, who she did a uh, important interview with before he passed away. Thank you. Gabriel, would you like to add anything? Yeah, just 
one thing, it's interesting that uh, we can do the same now with May 68. Speaking of May 68, right? They were here, they are in the, they are preparing what, what, what will become May 68, the uprising of 68, and they're looking into the community and saying, okay, people say it was a failure, but we have something to learn from that. And it's the same thing with May 68. Uh, it's a funny coincidence, right? Or perhaps it's not a coincidence because they were interested in this kind of movement. May 68 is usually also uh, condemned for not having leaders, for not having, you know, for not taking the control of state, you know, the fact that it was not a real revolution because they didn't do this kind of things. And actually, if we work on this relationship of how uh, movements like the SI looked into the past of the commune or the Syrian revolution or Spartakist or Constrat, uh, Constat, etc. And we can put, you know, May 68 and this series of failed revolutions that still have learning, but probably have something to, to teach us. Thank you. I really like this idea, actually, of the sort of failures aren't failures, they're just successes. You've just got to mine them for to see what happened and what went wrong and build on that. Um, I'm going to open it out now to questions uh, from the audience. So if you are an audience member who would like to ask a question, if you could either stick it in the Q&A function or in the chat, or if you'd like to ask it out loud, um, could you raise your hand? I think you can do that. Or if you can't raise your hand, just put in the chat, I would like to ask a question or something like that. Um, first up then, Nick Parsons. You should be able to speak um, if you unmute yourself. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yeah, you're right. Okay, yeah, th thanks um, both for, for a fascinating discussion. Um, I've got two questions really, and they're quite different. One, one is, can you, can you comment on the way in which the Paris Commune is being celebrated or not celebrated today, and how the uh, situationist interpretation of the Commune has influenced those commemorations today and the way in which we see the Commune today? Um, particularly in terms of the popular press, for example, and disseminating a view of the commune to the, to the wider population in France. And, and, and the other question really is one around the situation is international itself and the early 60s um, leading up to May 68. And I can understand the, the, the sort of suspicion of organized forces, but there's a lot of emphasis being placed on the workers' movement here. And I just wonder why the SI didn't form any closer relationship with the CFDT, which is emerging as a, you know, a, a new left force just at that time when the SI was most active as well. So just a couple of comments on that as well. Thanks very much. Um, over to both of you. Shall I start? Yeah, I think in regards to the first question, uh, that's really interesting and I don't, but I, I mean, cause I'm not in France, I can't go over, I can't, um, I haven't really been in, engaging with uh, how right now it's being received. I do remember about 10 years ago, there was, you know, with the, another kind of 140 years anniversary. And I remember that the, um, there was, I, I feel like it was really kind of for the first time that the, the Fifth Republic tried to do, I guess, a situation, situation as we call it, a recuperation of the Paris Commune. And there was an exhibition in the Hotel de Ville, which I thought was already a bit weird because this, the Commune had burnt down the Hotel de Ville and then it had been rebuilt. Um, but I guess maybe the idea was that that's what that was the seat of the commune. So that was the idea. But anyway, and, and then they had uh, the way it was presented was like, oh, this was the first um, kind of uh, like the first move towards, uh, pe you know, working class people in government um, and social reform. So it was kind of trying to present the commune as a forerunner, essentially, of the French social model and the, and the Fifth Republic, weirdly, in aspects of it, at least that pretends to. Uh, represent workers and all that kind of stuff and then there was also the destruction of the column alongside a condemnation of that destruction by um, uh, Victor Hugo so uh, I thought that, I thought that was quite interesting that, that I think the French state realizes that um, it needs to have to shape that memory to some extent 
and in a way that's quite different to how it was remembered before because uh before it was that oh these were misguided patriots um who wanted to keep fighting when it was impossible that was basically the the idea under the third and fourth republics how it was remembered now to what extent the si have shaped that i mean i think i think that it has become so important to uh, the French left's ideas of um, uh, itself, that the Commune has become, perhaps partly because of its importance in May 68, has become a, an even more important aspect of its identity, although it probably always has been, but that this more left wing kind of idea of it has a more positive idea of it has now needed to be recuperated. In terms of the second world, I mean, the SI were absolutely against unions. Uh, they wanted to abolish work. Um, in particular, they they were concerned with uh, unions as a form of um, that. Basically, once you get into uh, these kind of representative forms of uh, workers' organisation, that the representation comes to stand above and against the workers. So they argued in favour instead of workers' councils, not as a prescriptive, but as an example of a kind of um, directly democratic um, form. It's funny because the CFDT, the CFDT were arguing for very much the same sort of thing as well. Yeah, but I, I mean, again, but the SI are not about, you know, traditional workers' demands. It's about, um, you know, total transformation of society and abolition of work sort of thing. Uh, the, you know, the realisation of art in everyday life, the abolition of um, uh, alienated forms of creativity and, and things like that. So, you know, it, that, that for them is the most important thing and, and that they were constantly um, really heavily against bureaucracy and, and all that kind of stuff that any kind of uh, official institutional, you know, union or federation like that would represent in that sense. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, I will let uh, Alex, Alex White has a, has a question. I'll allow you to speak, Alex. Um, and I'll mute you, Nick, sorry. <laughs> Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah you're all good. Brilliant. Um, well, thanks so much for the talk. Uh, that was fascinating and I really had no idea about these deep historical precedents that the situation has turned to in their efforts to construct a kind of uh, non-Leninist Marxism. Um, if I can ask a broader question about that, um, to what extent were the situationists um, interested in non-Leninist Marxist ideas from outside of France, say in its former colonies or in India? Um, and, and if they weren't particularly, could you position their interest in the commune as an attempt to find an authentically French Marxism? Just on Gabriel. Yes, um, I don't think I don't think they were much aware. That, you know, actually, well, I have to consider a couple of things, right? How ideas circulated, and you know, like language barriers and uh, actual circulation of texts, right? We're not people weren't googling anything, right? They, they, you have to. To have something, you have to have some kind of publication that arrives in the bookshop near the place you live and get it and you read and etc. So um, they were, so the, the readings, for example, I have studied the Boer's reading notes. So he, he would read mainly in French. He knew a bit of other languages, but normally he would prefer translations. It's very rare to find. Uh, text in different languages in his reading notes. So it really depends on translations. That's why, for example, this, uh, this journal I mentioned earlier, Argument, uh, was actually a very useful journal also for the SI and for everyone interested in, in critical thought at the time because they translated a lot of texts. And um, for example, texts from uh, um, uh, from uh, Frankfurt School, the first translations were in, uh, in, in their journal. And then also after the journal you had, uh, they, they started publishing a book series in Edition de Minuit. It was also entitled Argument, and it was directed by the same, the same person, Costas Axelos, which was a, a, a intellectual of Greek ori origin. 
And uh, in this uh, book series is where you find the translation of uh, uh, Histoire et de Class, so uh, um, History and Class Consciousness of Georg Lukács, and also where you find uh, uh, books by um, Marcuse and other important thinkers of the time. From um, so, and all uh, all those books I mentioned is books that situation is read that the board read, and uh, so just to say that you know language is a barrier, and um, and so it it really depends. That's also why I stress that this shift into politics. That's why I think it's so important to take into consideration uh, the relationships they had at that time. The fact that you have someone coming from Hungary that goes into the group. The fact that the board is going to meetings that with Socialismo Barbary. The fact that they are meeting Lefebvre, because all these are bridges for getting to know other things, right? So via Socialismo Barbary, they get they can get in touch with things that are being discussed in other countries too that are being sent, you know, because different groups send texts to each other and etc. And I think to better understand this kind of, you know, to maybe to be able to better answer your question, we actually we still need more research because we need to look into other members of the group. So far, uh, researchers on the other side, they are mainly focused on the Bohr, if not the Bohr or Uvenigen, because they are the, the main names. But for example, you had uh, someone in the SI, um, Mustafa Kayati, who is uh, someone who spoke Arab and many other languages. So he would, he has translated uh, SI texts into Arab. After afterwards, he translated Arthur Lenin's text into Arab, and so he's built in bridges with other uh, spaces and other languages. And we need to start looking into. So he was responsible for correspondences of the group. So maybe if you look into his archives, we are going to see that they were aware of many other things that were being discussed in other countries in, in other languages. Yeah, um, can I just add to that? Um, yeah. I, think, I think it's, it's really uh, important that uh, we understand the SI was really anti-nationalist and internationalist. That's, it was a genuine international group. They had people uh, from all over the world world and they wrote about um, colonial struggles uh, all over the world, particularly um, what was going on to Congo, but also the Black Civil Rights Movement, um, you know, North Africa, et cetera, et cetera, constantly write about that. And they had, you know, they had uh, Congolese members and so on and so forth. Uh, and as Gabriel said, there's, there's so much interesting research to be done about these, uh, these people as well that hasn't been done because, of course, it's all focused on uh, the board, not even the Nigel, <laughs> really, particularly. Um, and um, so, so yeah, so the SI, uh, you know, they're not, they aren't Marxist. They said we are Marxist in the same way that Marx said, I am not a Marxist. And I believe that was a letter that Marx wrote to Lafargue where he was talking about, you know, the kind of late 19th century uh, French socialists. So, you know, in a way it's also a call, you know, they're reading Marx against Marxism in that sense. And they're not interested in a, an authentic French Marxism. It's just that, you know, the commune uh, the, the, is one, you know, this, this text is important for them. But they're, you know, they're also writing about the Kronstadt uh, rebellion um, against the Bolsheviks in, in Russia. They're writing about the Asturias revolts, um, the German revolution. So, so they're not interested in it just it, because it's French. And in actual, I've actually thinking, I wrote a book, um, that was published in 2019 uh, called the, um, the Critique of Work in French Thought, which kind of looking at the SI's Critique of Work. I was actually thinking about the next one might be uh, looking at similar authors, which would be, you know, um, no, no state, no nation, which would be looking at how in the French avant-garde you get, you know, get rejection of work, but you also get re re rejection of national identity and national framing of ideas. And, you know, in someone like Andre Breton, but also Guy Debord, who doesn't want to be seen as a French writer in that sense, I think. Yeah. Yeah, so we should really stress the international and situation is international, as mm -hmm. Alistair has just done. That's also something they are stressing about the Paris Commune. At the, at the end of the text, yes. they say that they oppose to the idea of uh, this recuperation of the Paris Commune as a national heritage for uh, French movements. And they say it was an international movement. Also, I would, so and and that's what I meant. We still need to look into other members that circulated in other spaces in other countries to better understand how this international dimension work. We have already a chapter, a first chapter, two 
chapters on that actually you know the book the collected volume we added the analyster mm -hmm. we have a, a chapter on anti-colonialist uh, struggles uh, in the si and also a chapter on internationalism and um so this is uh, and and also one thing i would add to not we should also uh, not forget what we were discussing previously the fact that they are really into uh they're really concerned with the relationship with the urban space and so the paris commune is not really a french movement it's something that happened in paris so mm. in the sense that it's also an example of what can we do in this place we are now right how can yeah. we fight against this uh uh Hausmannian, uh uh control system that was this urban uh, restructuring of Paris. So, and this is an example that could, if, if we learn how to fight against this kind of uh, urban reform in Paris, you can do this in Buenos Aires, you can do in, this in Rio, you can do this in other places that were restructured in the same way that modern urban is proposed. And uh, so it's, I, I think it's really connected to this um, memory of space uh, uh, I think that's something, one of the reasons why they were so keen into the Paris community. It's also, it's also related to that, learning from this barricades to do new barricades, and et cetera. And well, I think that's it. I think, uh, have we answered the question? Absolutely, very comprehensively. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Alex. Um, uh, we're going to have to wrap it up there, I'm afraid, because we're just over the hour. Um, thank you very much, uh, Alistair and Gabrielle, for that. That was a brilliant talk, really in-depth. And thank you to all our attendees for coming. Um, I hope you really enjoyed it. And thank you, uh, Nick and Alex, for your questions as well. Um, as I say, this we're going to check the recording after this, but it should be up on YouTube uh, at some point. Um, and just to say, as you leave the event, there will be a very brief survey. It's just two questions um, from the MLang events team uh, asking for feedback. We'd very much appreciate it if you could uh, fill that in. Um, and also, if you like, sign up to our monthly events listings as well. Um, so once again, thank you very much, um, Gabrielle, Alistair, awesome. and everybody else for coming. I'll stop the recording there, actually.